Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. The, the film you watched just now, it, it was made uh, in 2004 as part of Karl Khandala Ola Birth Centenary in 2004. Dr. Shailendra Bhandari, speaker of this evening, trustees of the museum present here. Dr. Firoja Godre, chairperson, Museum Society of Mumbai. Dr. Devangana Deshai, Dr. Shoryu Doshi, Dr. Vusha Bhatia, Mr. Sushil Premchand, distinguished guest, friends, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the trustees and staff of the museum and the Museum Society of Mumbai, I extend a warm welcome and greetings to everyone. The Karl J. Khandalawala Memorial Lecture was instituted immediately after his demise by the Museum Society of Mumbai in collaboration with the museum in the year 1998. He demised in April 1995, after two years, the lecture was instituted. The first KJK Memorial Lecture was delivered by Sri Jagdish Mittal, a noted private collector and also a close associate of Karl Khandalawala, on the subject, the unknown style of paintings of Tripoti, 1600 to 1900. Thereafter, many other distinguished scholars delivered this prestigious memorial lecture every year in different aspects of Indian art, culture, and architecture. The last lecture was delivered by Dr. Ashok Kumar Das, a distinguished senior scholar and art historian on the study of Mughal wall paintings as seen in contemporary miniature with an appropriate title, Frame Within a Frame. And today we have uh, Dr. Shailendra Bhandari, Senior Assistant Keeper of South Asian and Far Eastern Collections at the Asmolean Museum, University of Oxford, to deliver the 21st Karl Khandalawala Memorial Lecture on his latest research, a ra rather unusual subject, uh, flying high, flags, standards, and pennants in Indian numismatics and art. Dr. Bhandari is one of the few talented scholars in the country focused on various aspects of Indian newsmatics. Thank you for accepting our invitation. I take this opportunity to invite Dr. Devangana Deshai, our trustee, to felicitate Dr. Bhandari on behalf of all of us. Dr. Devangana Deshai. I, I personally consider myself uh, fortunate and honored because I was inter interviewed by KJK, Karl Khandalawala. <laughs> I, I, I remember, I still remember, uh, it was 1992. Uh, I had little knowledge about Karl Khandalawala as a student of archaeology. I referred a couple of articles, Khandala Ola Sab's article. So through article, I got to know him. But when I joined this museum as a research associate, uh, he used to come every Saturday and sit in the boardroom. And for your information, he was the only person who was allowed to smoke inside the boardroom. <laughs> And, and he, he had, you know, his typical style, that hop tie. So it took, you know, many years to understand, you know, why he used to wear that, you know, hop, hop tie. He used to cut the tie and he used to wear, you know, the hop tie. And then somebody told me that's, you know, KJK style. And there is nothing, you know, no, no story or no significance, but it is his style. And uh, he will come, he will sit in the boardroom, and there was a, there was a peon, Gangaram, 
uh, he, 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 was, he, he was working in the library as library assistant. He used to bring, you know, books. It's, it's like a mountain, eight, ten books in the boardroom. And then he will be referring books. He will be sitting there till evening. And then he used to leave. So I was told, uh, Mr. Mukherjee, you will be interviewed by our chairman, Khandalawala Saab. I was told by my predecessor, Sadashiv Gorakshekar. And I was quite nervous. I was quite nervous because of his stature. Uh, such a noted uh, scholar, art historian, will be interviewing me. Uh, so I went inside the boardroom. Yes, I was nervous, but he made me comfortable. He said, Mukherjee, sit down. You are from Shantiniketan. I hear from Gorak. He used to call Shadashiv Gorak Shekhar Gorak. I said, yes, sir. Uh, so uh, close to Tagore, Rabindranath Tagore? I said, my father was disciple of Rabindranath Tagore. Uh, that, that's very good. That's very good. Now, now tell me, uh, there was one sculpture. Uh, it, it was a Gandhara devotee. And, and the boardroom was storage come meeting room. So that, that sculpture was on the cabinet. And then he asked me, can you identify that sculpture? So I said, uh, yes, sir. Uh, this is a devotee from Gandhara. But what is the material? I said, uh, stucco. But you, you know what is stucco? So I explained to him. And he was satisfied. And then he said, you know, very strange question. Uh, that, that devotee, you think he was associated with any particular religion? So I said, a Gandhara devotee associated with Buddhism, Buddhist religion. And where do you find? Because it was a fragment. I said, usually you find in a relief panel, sometimes with Bodhisattva, sometimes with Buddha. And then after that, he said, you may go. And, and next day, I, I received the appointment letter from my predecessor, Shadashiv Gorakshekar. So I thought, you know, I just shared this uh, anecdote with you. Khandalawala's interest in Indian art is rooted in his love for history. He, he, he educated from, you know, Panchang, Panchagani, near Pune and graduated from Elphinstone College in history. And then he went to London for law. But his interest in Indian art was deeply rooted because of his uncle, Treasuriwala, B.N. Treasuriwala, a well-known collector of Indian art. Treasuriwala was not only a collector of paintings, but also eclectic in his taste. It is recorded that his enormous number of paintings, about 200, provided for the foundation of the National Museum's holdings of paintings. So the Treasuriwala collection went to National Museum, Delhi. That was a loss for Mumbai. Treasuriwala prevailed on Khandalawala to study his collection, and thus it all began. But those were the days when he had the opportunity of listening to such stalwarts as O.C. Ganguly, Ajit Ghosh, Father Harris, Moti Chandra, and others at the tea hosted by Treasury Walla every Sunday. Dr. Dosi, sometimes I say that we have to revive that tradition, Chai Pe Charcha. <laughs> but within the heart and soul, he was an art critic and art historian. His first book, Indian Sculpture and Painting, was published as early as in 1938, when he was 34 years old. His second major publication on Amrita Sergil, Ranjit, he wrote only one book, only one book on modern art, and that was on Amrita Sergil. You will not find any you know, second article or second book by Khandalawala. The famous young Indian artist, 
who set a trend of modern art in India was published in 1944. In his foreword, he writes, I quote, and for your information, uh, Amrita Sergil was very close to Khandala Walasaf. In fact, Amrita was promoted by Khandala Wala. She was in big controversy. She suffered a lot. And I just quote, you know, uh, from Khandala Wala Sahib's foreword. Within living memory, please listen carefully. Within living memory, no artist in this country has aroused so much controversy or engendered so much hatred and jealousy in her fellow artist. Nor has any artist suffered so much ridicule from an ignorant public. Her work was a living challenge to decadence and bad taste. It was a living challenge to all that was untruthful in art." Unquote. While concluding his research on Amrita Sergil, he writes, I quote, Amrita Sergil's pictures are not easy to understand. Her titles had little con connection with what she was seeking to convey. She was not a subject painter in any sense of the term. She coordinated her magnificent color sense and exceptional sensitivity for form into certain combinations which in every great work of art due to the action of some mysterious laws awaken a deep emotional response in a knowledgeable spectator." Unquote. His Pari miniature painting is a classic which even today serves as the guideline for scholars. He authored several monumental works with Eric Dickinson. He was the director of Lahore Museum, Moti Chandra, and others. The development of style in Indian painting was his other important work. He has also revised and edited two great works of Indian art history, one by B.S. Smith and the other one by A. Kumar Shami. Curl was closely associated with the National Museum New Delhi from its inception and was a member of its purchase committee. As a trustee and chairman of the formerly Prince of Wales Museum, Khandalawala helped the museum build its Indian collection into a strong one and also one of the best in the country. The museum is also a beneficiary of his personal collection of about 700 works of art. Khandalawala's collection is diverse, but miniature paintings predominate. Some of the best Pahari paintings are those of the Basholi, Guler, and Kangra. His fascination for the legendary Pahari master artist Noyan Shuk is evident from the fact that nine of the master's works are included in his collection. So today we have the largest Noyan Shuk collection in the world, thanks to Karl Khandalawala. The paintings of Raja Balwan Singh by the Pahari master Noyan Shuk are among our greatest treasures and the envy of many museums. Masterpieces from his collection in the museum were published in the form of a catalog in 2004 by the trustees of the museum and was authored by Dr. Protapaditya Pal and Dr. Kalpana Deshai. Dr. Protapaditya Pal writes, I quote, his great work, Pahari Miniature Painting, completed in 1956, though not finally until 1958, summed up all that was then known of the subject and as a reference book. It has been in this indispensable to scholars ever since. It will be evident how much the present study owes to masterly contribution. Art historian, author, distinguished barrister, and legal luminary Karl Khandala had held a unique position in the country by virtue of his profound knowledge of the manifold arts of India. 
no other museums in the country had the privilege of having as its chairman for so many years a person of the eminence of Khandalawala who had generously donated to the museum his magnificent personal collection of the arts of India. The great archaeologist and art historian, Professor Arnath, in his foreword to Kalje Khandalawala Felicitation Volume, was published in 1996. I quote, it is always a pleasure to read him and more to hear him. He uses a simple to the point and business-like language with total command without ornaments or hyperboles. He handles his subject extremely thoroughly and judiciously without undue sympathy and arrives at the most logical conclusion. He is argumentative rather than ingenious, yet he is absolutely rational as can be justly expected from him. He is sincere with his data, almost to the point of ruthlessness, which is why his writing are rich in content and his conclusions are abiding. Thank you, thank you for being with us. Yeah. May I now request uh, our friend Ranjit Hoskote to introduce Dr. Bhandari? Though the image might be, the notion that we are in a protected island of some kind is a very engaging one. Uh, and everything that Mr. Mukherjee said in his evocation of Karl Khandalawala reminds us that as an institution, this museum partakes of the nature of a university, of a forum, of a place of ideas, and continues with, um, with this legacy, with the legacy of scholars and savants and investigators into culture such as Khandalawala. And this series of memorial lectures is really a, a testament to that, to that kind of commitment on the part of the institution. And it gives me special pleasure for all kinds of reasons to be able to welcome Dr. Shailendra Bhandare, not least because uh, we've known each other since we were 15 years old. And uh, I, looking back at, over this long period of time, it's, uh, I think it was a blessing as an adolescent to have friends who had interests of this kind, um, interests in numismatics, in science fiction, in modern architecture, in contemporary art. Uh, and so, for some of us, those interests became our, our, our life, really. And, uh, with, with Shailene, with Dr. Shailendra Bhandari, this preoccupation with numismatics, with what it tells us about the past, is really also for him a way of meditating on what kind of future awaits us. Dr. Bhandari is senior assistant keeper of South Asian and Far Eastern, uh, of the South Asian and Far Eastern coin collections at the Ashmolean Museum at the University of Oxford. He's a fellow of St. Cross College and a member of the Faculty of Oriental Studies. He diverged from an early detour into the natural sciences to, to then uh, to hold a visiting fellowship at the Fitzwilliam Museum at the University of Cambridge, uh, then went on to hold a postdoctoral fellowship at the Society for South Asian Studies, was for a while with the British Museum, working on the coins of the later Mughals and the Indian princely states, and was appointed curator of coins at the Ashmolean in 2002. His interests, as many of you know, are, are wide-ranging. They vary across several chronological uh, sequences. He has, uh, and those of us who've heard him here before know that he uh, addresses the coinage of the Huns, the coinage of the, the Western Kshatrapas, the Satvahanas, and many of these other dynasties who otherwise would simply be names in a, in a, in a, in a, in a genealogy to consider what this tells us about cultural confluences, religious experimentation, political shifts, forms of governance, uh, concerns that bring these coins out of mere objecthood, so to speak, or connoisseurial fetishization, and make them alive and real and relevant to us. Uh, today he's going to address the whatever this may be, uh, but that's not what you're addressing, Shailen. Uh, the, the theme that Dr. Bhandari is going to address today is flying high, flags, standards, and pennants in Indian numismatics and art. 
and through this comparative study, I do hope he will engage with such open, large open questions, I think, as is, as, uh, is there an Indian heraldry? Uh, what forms of, of um, hierarchy do our flag standards and pennants across various periods fall into? Uh, these symbolisms of achievement, lineage, hierarchy, and so on, how might we approach them? Are there canons through which we can do this? Uh, does new ground remain to be opened? And I'm wondering also if Dr. Bhandari would address as he goes along the kinds of historical moments, for instance, that you find in uh, the essays that Terence Ranger and Eric Hobsbawm put together in The Invention of Tradition, where they dwell on the various darbars that were held in late colonial India and how it was through those darbars, in fact, that some of this heraldry, rules of precedence, etiquette, coats of arms, and so on, actually got uh, created. So perhaps it's under the sign of the invention of tradition that this lecture might unfold, but I know that there will be many surprises, revelations, and new material and insights that await us here. So uh, may I now invite you, Shailen, to address us. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Bandari. It gives me a great pleasure and honor to be uh, delivering this lecture. So uh, thanks to all the dignitaries present here, and thanks to Dr. Sabashachi Mukherjee for giving me this uh, opportunity this time. Thanks, Ranjit, also for this lovely little snippet of introduction. Um, I must say that when I started uh, researching on this, and I found that uh, indeed uh, very little has been said. So I'm going to show a, a bit of uh, you know, outlay a bit of a theory in this, and then subsequently we'll go and sort of, you know, uh, probe further into um, what, what I uh, what to say about flags and... Uh... So um, there is, there has been some anthropological work uh, that has gone in theorizing flags. What are flags? What, what do we do? And um, generally they're associated with nations and ethnicities and cultural groups and as uh, postmodern uh, theory says that these are indeed sort of imagined communities, to quote Benedict Anderson. And uh, mind you, there is a word for it. There is something, you know, there is a word called vexillology for study of flags, which I, I, I was not aware of as I came across uh, through uh, the things. However, in uh, the particular Indian context, uh, the word dwaja that we use for flags has a, a certain ambiguity about it. And flags, it, dwaja is not just a flag, not just a uh, pennant, it's not a cloth, piece of cloth fluttering on a pole, but it's also a standard, it's also an emblem, and it's also a flag. So it's, it, is, it is this sort of, in a particular Indian context, there, is, there are more meanings to dwaja uh, than, uh, than just a flag. And there are three Fs of dwaja, it's form, features and functions. So this is where we will see how these dwajas are, are, are working. The dwajas are instrumental objects. They, they, they are actually conveying something. And uh, what do they convey? The main thing is recognition, uh, messaging, symbolizing. So from an anthropological sense, they have what we call as indexical uses. They, they, you know, there's a particular indexicality about uh, using these flags. Um, you could sort of split them further into affiliative uses, locative uses, and performative uses. Affiliative are cultured, sort of cultic uses, or totemic, as uh, Levi Strauss uh, would say. Locative, they actually mark the placement of a person or a particular ritual. And performative, they're sort of you know, part of a ritual in, in itself. So um, dwajas are also markers. They, they, they mark time and space and also everything that is liminal between the time and space. So they actually, de actually denote a place where the liminal ends and you sort of enter into a different uh, zone as such. And uh, they are visual. They, are, they, they, they carry a certain visuality, as we shall see. Um, there is a lot of discussion anthropologically about what are condensed symbols, how the symbols are condensed in particular forms, and what message do they deliver in, in decimal manner. And that particular condensation of symbols, when you combine with numismatic constraints, that, you know, coins are very, very small objects. And the kind of messages that one has to show through these, the, these objects uh, have their own constraints. So that kind of gives it a unique uh, perspective when these objects are used on, on coins. Um, the, at the outset, I must say that there has been some discussion in literature about flags and dwajas in general, 
but there is not much said about uh, from an Indian perspective. And I mean, you know, if you open the Wikipedia entry or something simple like that, you will say that the tradition of the flags was invented in India. And we don't know. We don't know when it was invented, what exactly happened, how it was done. But obviously, there are very clear references to even the uh, anci most ancient uh, literary traditions, such as Rig Veda, which mentions Ketu, which is a similar word to Dvaja. And there are particular instances where there is the kind of visual metaphor that is being employed. So for Agni and Surya, and there are sort of similes. So for example, the sacrificial fire is shown to be a fluttering banner. The, the flames flutter like a banner. And the sun, uh, the hymn to the sun, uh, mentions that the rays of the sun are like a shaft. And instead of actually emanating out of the sun and reaching the earth, they visualize the shaft the, the, ray, the shaft of the ray actually holding up the sun uh, as a kind of a standard. So it's supporting the, the object. So uh, my talk, because it's a huge subject, and I, I'm, I'm sure uh, when I started researching, it's more like a, almost like a, a subject of a PhD proposal, really. And uh, I, I'm going to ask somebody like Vidya Deheje or someone like that to actually put a student behind this, because it's absolutely fascinating. So just a, just a teaser. So I'm going to divide my lecture into two parts. One is sort of ancient and medieval India, and one is going to be on Mughals. And um, in the ancient part, we shall see something about uh, how cultic symbolize, uh, symbolism is, is shown through, uh, through the Dwajas, the Pancharatra, Shaiva, and other cults that are sort of em em emblematically represented in Dwajas. Then there is a decoration, auspiciousness, and how these kind of symbols then talk multiple languages. This is one of my um, favorite subjects, uh, how, how one particular symbol talks different languages to different audiences. Um, there are also ritualistic depictions that we shall see. In part two, in Mughal and pre-modern India, we shall see something about how uh, f the, the flags are depicted in certain miniature paintings. Uh, the subject is absolutely huge, so I've chosen only to focus on Pachanama and from the, from the royal collection in Windsor, where it's an absolutely fabulous manuscript, as one knows. So we shall see something about that. And of course, throughout this, I'm going to cross-pollinate the discussion with uh, representations of these things seen on coins. That's the main, the main purpose. In the Pancharatra symbolism, uh, we know that this was a cult. This was a pre-Vaishnava sort of proto -Vaishnava cult. And there were four heroes in which uh, the divine, which was Narayana, uh, sort of manifests itself in forms. And uh, the forms that uh, Narayana manifests itself are Vasudeva, Sankarsana, and Pradyumna, and Aniruddha. And out of these four heroes, there are three heroes which are known by their, by their standards. So Vasudeva had a wheel standard, uh, Sankarsana had a plow standard, and uh, Pradyumna had a crocodile or a makara standard. And this is uh, probably the, one of the most famous coins uh, showing uh, Sankarsana on one side holding aloft the plow and Vasudeva on the other side holding the wheel. And as we know that this is probably the earliest datable representation of any Indic deities in iconic form, and it is found on the silver coins of the Indo-Greek king Agathocles, uh, who ruled around 195 to 185 BC. The Pancharatra cult and the cultic heroes have been part of uh, early historic religious spectrum. Uh, and we know that there are references to famous uh, inscriptions. So for example, uh, the Heliodorus inscription in, in, in Vidisha uh, mentions that this pillar is actually a Garuda Dvaja. So this is the, a, a pillar on which a Garuda emblem had stood. The Nanighat inscription, which is near Junar, opens uh, with uh, salutations to Sankarsana and Vasudeva. So does uh, the Ghoshundi inscription, which is, in, which is found near Nagari in Rajasthan, talks about establishment of a Nara and a Vatika. This is one of the earliest Sanskrit inscriptions in the country that we know of. So this was a part of uh, a wide sort of religious picture of early India. Coin-wise, uh, you find uh, the plow standard and the wheel has been part of the symbolic program of even the earliest punch mark coins. So this is about uh, 400 to 350 BC. So coins help us 
um, establish the symbolic genealogy of these standards much, much, much earlier than what art does. So that is very important that these parts, uh, these symbols were part of the cultural or symbolic repertoire of, uh, of uh, Indian, early Indian religious systems, even at a very early date. Um, you find them on the, the wheel and the plow on this coin, which has the name of Pushyamitra. We don't know whether this is Pushyamitra Shunga or not, but there is something, it's, the, the inscription reads Pushyamitra. And sometimes here, as you can see, it's in a railing and supported on a platform, and these two standards, the plow and the wheel, are shown side by side. That's a coin from Malwa, and it's dated to about uh, first century BC. Something similar happens in Maharashtra from Marathwada, first century BC. You have the plow and the wheel atop uh, an elephant symbol, which uh, symbolizes uh, the royalty. Um, we have very interesting depictions of these standards, also from objects such as this wonderful uh, corn shell, which was discovered in uh, the excavations at Nagarjuna Konda. And the conch has this depiction of the pedestal with the, the, the plow and the, the wheel standards. And on the other side of the same shell, there is this inscription in Brahmi, which reads Bhagavato Athabhuja Samisa. And this is the reference to a god named Ashtabhuja Swamin. And in the excavations, we know from other inscriptional evidence that a temple dedicated to Ashtabhuja Swamin was discovered at the same place. And there has been, there had been a, a kind of a debate where Ashtabhuja Swamin is a Shaiva or a Vaishnava deity form. And this particular object helps it nail as a, as a, as a Vaishnavite uh, deity. Um, much like the, the plow and, uh, uh, and the, plow, uh, the wheel standards, there are other standards known from coins as well. And here are some examples of the Makara standard, which is stand on, a, on a pole, and there is a crocodile and in a railing. Uh, the Makara was a standard of Pradyumna, the third of the Pancharatra heroes. And uh, here as well, coin from Ayodhya, uh, where there is a Makara on a pedestal uh, shown in, in, in sort of a schematic manner. Um, Balarama, or Sankarshana, the second of the Pancharatra heroes, was also shown through a standard which was um, uh, the palm tree. So it was a taladvaja rather than makara and 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 uh, and uh, uh, chakra or uh, haladvaja. There was a taladvaja as well, and you can see that there is a, a depiction of a palm tree on a hill. That's a coin from um, uh, Malwa, sort of north north northern Malwa, from a city state of Erach, which is sort of located near Jhansi in in modern day context. And all of these uh, depictions that you see on coins have direct parallels in contemporary Indian art, which is, as you can see, uh, that's a, a part of a, a, a palm tree capital, which is lying in the vicinity of uh, the Heliodorus pillar at Vidisha. But it, this is, this is there's a big tree next to it, and it just is lying outside at the, at the base of that tree. But this is obviously part of the same cultic complex. And the more famous one, this is the, the palm tree capital from Pavaya, or Padmavati, and this is in the Gujri Mahal Museum in, in Gwalior. And this is particularly interesting because it also shows this little ass or donkey. And there's a story of Balarama killing the ass demon by hurling it on the top of a, a palm tree. So this is what is depicted here. So this, the, the standard is clearly associated with the Balarama cult. Similarly to these, we have examples of Makara capitals. And this is from Koshambi. Uh, currently in the Allahabad Museum, and this is also from Vidisha. So you can see that at Vidisha, there were um, the, the Garuda Dvaja, the Makara Dvaja, and the Tala Dvaja. All the three uh, dedicatory uh, Dvajas to the Pancharatra heroes were present in, at Vidisha. Uh, sometimes you find that the form is then subsequently changed. And this is something very interesting. This is something that I want to research further. I haven't really researched very much. But that's a famous uh, plow capital from the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. And you can see that a part of it is, has become a kind of a lion emblem. And what is the exact connection between the lion and the plow vis-a-vis -vis Balarama or Sankarshana is something that needs to be uh, researched further. But you can see that there is a Balarama image in the Mathura Museum collection where a similar standard is right behind 
the, the Balarama figure, and here is exactly the same figure of the lion and the plow over a particular standard visible. This is precisely what we see in the coins of the Western Kshatrapas, and that's a coin of uh, Bhumaka, the Shaka ruler in uh, Gujarat or Katiawa or Kutch region, and the precisely the same, the lion and the plow standard and the wheel standard are shown juxtaposed with um, on, a on a pedestal. What is uh, particularly fascinating is that when these symbols, depending on their cultic sort of associations, start assuming different identities and different forms. So on the coin of the Vrishni tribal republic, which is, was located in South Rajasthan or North Gujarat, we see that the form of the object is very, very similar. There's a lion, but the plow has now become an elephant's head. And here, it is very clear that both these animals, the elephant and the lion, were associated closely more with Buddhism rather than Vaishnavism at this time. And the nature of this particular standard as a Buddhist standard has been accentuated by the fact that there is a Buddhist symbol of the three ratna, the symbol symbolizing three jewels of the Buddhist tradition is placed right next to it. On the reverse, there is a wheel, but again, this is not the wheel of uh, Vasudeva Krishna, but this is the Buddhist wheel of law. So exactly the same program, as you see on the Vaishnavite uh, or proto-Vaishnavite uh, forms, has now been changed to articulate a Buddhist vocabulary. This is something which is very, very interesting that people find these forms um, kind of standardized and then they put these little changes into them to show that they have different vocabularies uh, adopted to them. Continuing with the Buddhist theme, we find that the wheel standard as such had been uh, manifested in Buddhist manifestations for a long time. Um, so that's, uh, and these were actual objects. We have inscriptional evidence that these were actually created and endowed at Buddhist stupas, the, the wheel standards um, outside the Buddhist stupas. So this is a de depiction from the Sanchi Stupa one, Southern Gateway, and that is uh, a Buddhist chakra standard from the famous site of Kanaganahalli, which was recently discovered in, um, in Karnataka uh, near Sannati in the Bhima Valley. Very similar depictions are seen on coins from disparate regions. Now this is you can see that Sanchi, Karnataka, and then you go over to Gandhara, where a similar depiction of the wheel standard uh, and these two deer, that's very important to show the, show the deer because obviously, as, as you know, that the first sermon of the Buddha was in the deer park at, at uh, Sarnath, and that is what is shown. So the, 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 the occurrence of deer as part of the symbolic program of this is very, very significant. And this is precisely what you see on um, coin from, of the Huns from the Gandhara. Uh, it is interesting uh, because the Huns are traditionally considered as anti-Buddhist. And, but this coin shows us something completely different. Not only they have um, sort of incorporated the Buddhist emblem of the chakra standard with two deer, but the inscription on the, the, the coin reads, Jayato Dharmagato, victorious is the one who has come to the Dharma. So it's obviously someone, the king who had issued this coin must have, must have been a Buddhist patron. Uh, similarly, the base gold dinar of Jayanaga who was a patron of Buddhism, as mentioned in the ancient Buddhist uh, text Manjushri Mula Kalpa from Bengal, uh, shows himself in a sort of Gupta fashion, but behind there is a chakra standard, uh, which is clearly denotes his religious affiliations. By far the most interesting uh, employment or deployment of the chakra standard comes up in the image of the Chakravartin. And this is a a classic uh, standardized emblem of Chakravartin, the universal king, which is seen in the art of Amaravati and Nagarjuna Konda from Andhra region. And here the king extends his one hand upwards and skywards and touches the clouds so as to invoke a shower of wealth. So this is what he's doing. He's, he's touching the clouds and invoking the shower of wealth. But because he's a universal Chakravartin ruler, he's always associated with a Chakra standard next to him. 
So here, an example from Musée Guimet in Paris, there is a chakra standard here. In the Madras Museum example, the chakra standard is shown here, whereas this recently excavated example from Fanigiri from in Telangana, the chakra standard is right, right next to the king's uh, depiction. So as you can see, the chakra standard depicts, uh, shows different levels of indexicality here. One is cultic, one is to show the, the prowess of the king, one is to show affiliations to certain religions. So there are various ways in the same symbol can be deployed in programmatic art to talk about different aspects of um, what the person wants to show through these particular uh, emblems. Of course, there are other standards. We're so, so far talking only about sort of proto vaishnavite standards who then become and talk language of Buddhist standards. But by far the most common Shaivite standard is the trident battle axe, which you see on this famous uh, tile painting from the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, where a four-armed Shiva is embracing or holding this trident in his hand with a battle axe attached to it. And, it, uh, and, and that is particularly the Shaivite standard. And you can see this on Kushan coins, where the Shaiva uh, uh, Vima Karfisis, who was a very famous Shaivite ruler, puts it on the reverse of his, uh, of his uh, coins with the Vajra at the base of it, the Damaru-shaped object at the base of it, and this little shaft that comes out of it is a Linga. So it's a very condensed Shaivite object, and the Shaivite standard of trident battle axe plays a particular indexical role into its identification as a Shaivite standard. Similarly, on the coins of Audumbaras, the tribes from uh, northern Punjab region, uh, King Dharagosha's drams in silver have the Shaivite trident battle axe standard uh, in, on, on them as well. Apart from these, of course, there are other standards. This is not the end of the standard story. Um, quite interestingly, there are Skanda standards. So from, on this coin from Vidarbha, uh, in the early independent king in Vidarbha in the post maurian period, King Surya Mitra, shows a Kukuta standard, the, cock, the rooster standard on the reverse. And that is a clear indication of the prevalence or the popularity of the Skanda cult in these regions. Um, the same Skanda cult occurs on the coin from Gujarat of post Gupta period, where the standard is actually the javelin, which is a kind of an attribute in the Skanda's hand, and that of itself becomes a standard. Very interestingly, uh, a Yaksha face coin from Taxila shows uh, the fish standard next to it, and on the reverse, there is a particular standard which is topped with a, a lotus flower. So there are standards where we really do not know what exactly they meant as well. I mean, you know, some, some, some standards are easily recognizable as by the objects. So for example, the, the rooster was associated with Skanda, so we can say that it was a Skanda standard. But we really don't know what this particular association of the fish and the yaksha has been, or indeed the yaksha and the lotus pillar has been. But of course, there must have been something because they're always, uh, as we can see, they're shown together. Flags, on the other hand, are very much part of Indian art in terms of, oops, in terms of uh, processions. And two examples, one from uh, the Barut Stupa and one, the famous depiction of uh, the elephant uh, from the caves at Bhaja, the Vihara cave at Bhaja near Lonavla. What is very interesting here is the flag or the standard is always carried by the rider who sits at the back. It's never by the front rider. It's always the rider who sits at the back. And you can see that it's a very simple construction. There's a shaft. There is a Buddhist sort of emblem at the top. There is a, a, a horizontal uh, kind of stick. And the flag is fluttering, sort of left fluttering at the, from the stick. And in many cases, as you can see in, on these depictions of details from the Sanchi Torana, that the, 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 the banner has supports. Uh, so for example, here you can see it very clearly that the horizontal banner, horizontal stick, has two supports. And, the, uh, and it sort of connects the vertical shaft here. So 
this particular kind of banner or flag was then schematically shown on coins, as we shall see. Um, on the stupa at Sanchi, we see two distinct uh, uses of such kind of flags. One is processional, as we can see, but also as part of armies. The, the banners are very clearly part of, in, in a sort of military use. So this was a, a famous uh, uh, instance where war over Buddha's relics was depicted on one of these um, uh, stupa architraves uh, on the south gate of stupa number one at Sanchi. And here you can see that there are flags flying everywhere. There's a flag here, there's a flag here. On this side, there is a, a chariot, but then there are elephants and there's a flag flying behind. And you can see that there are this kind of horizontal uh, 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 um, stick with this triangle head attached to it. This is particular form in schematic representation, we find a lot of numismatic depictions. So numismatists have traditionally called it a triangle-headed standard. But it's not exactly a triangle-headed standard, it's actually that flag that you see. And the flutter of the cloth on these coins has been schematically shown by these two lines. Uh, so that is actually what is, what is shown as, as, the, as the banner which is fluttering behind it. And all over the world, uh, Indian subcontinent, Erach city-state near Jhansi, Virisha in central Malwa, Banavasi in North Karnataka, where a sort of an ornamental form appears. Sometimes the same thing is shown conjoined with other forms. So for example, on this coin of Kunindas from Punjab and Himachal Pradesh, the triangle banner is kind of conjoined with a little half part of the Sri Vatsa symbol, which was associated with, again, Vaishnavas. So there is these kind of, kind of symbolic uh, intermixing, the marriages that we see. And very rarely, you also find a three-dimensional depiction, and that is from Pallavas of Kanchi, deep south. So this sort of depiction of banners is spread between the first four centuries of AD all across the Indian subcontinent. Right from Punjab down to Kanchi, you have many, many, many coins showing this sort of flag, as association with royalty, with processions, with particular indexical values. And that is a, a, a really uh, rare depiction where the flag is shown like almost like 3D effect. Apart from cults and processions and royalty, as I said, uh, standards often mark particular rituals. And that happens even now. We have a wedding, we, partic we, we put a torana at, in the front of the house gate. And that is kind of the standards that we mark that this is going to a place where certain auspicious rituals are going to take place. So putting the standard up was a main part of any sacrificial ritual. And there's a particular word for a sacrificial standard, and that is a yupa. And you can, so, you can see that the yupa appears on many, many coins which are struck with particular uh, reference to certain royal rituals. So on the coin of the Yaudheyas from Haryana region, there is a bull standing here, and there is a yupa in a railing. Yupas, I must say, are shown in very particular ways. The shaft always goes up and sort of curls down in a sort of a walking stick-like manner. And these were most likely denote a particular sacrifice, a particular ritual, where the bull was consecrated and then set free from agricultural duties. And this particular sacrifice was always called, was referred to by the name Vrushot Sarga. The Vrusha was left, let free uh, uh, for, from agricultural labor. Um, by far, one of the most important and most famous uh, sacrifices ever to have happened in ancient India is Ashwamedha, the horse sacrifice. And probably the most famous of the Gupta coins is the coin struck by Samudra Gupta for the horse sacrifice. And here, there's a very beautiful depiction of the sacrificial standard in front of the horse. The horse is going to be sacrificed in, and the, the, the standard sort of flutters above his head. And you can see that it, it goes up and then hooks around. That's a particular um, construction of a sacrificial standard. On the coins issued by Naganika, these are the first coins issued by a queen, an indigenous queen in India, um, you find that we know that she conducted not one but two horse sacrifices, as we know from the Nanaghat inscription details. And these coins show a kind of pillar upon which her name is written in a railing, with the railing is down here, 
and on the top of the pillar is the figure of a horse. So quite clearly, this, mar this particular uh, coin was struck to issue, um, to, to mark the horse sacrifice with uh, this kind of uh, standard with the horse on the top. So much so for uh, ancient part, and as I said, I would like to now move uh, to a completely different time zone and completely different me medium. And so we, we turn um, to the Mughals and later periods. Um, here, I'm going to mainly focus uh, attention not so much on sculpture, but on uh, mainly on miniature paintings. And uh, I know that uh, KJK, as you referred to him, uh, was mainly famous for his research in, in everybody talks about Karl Kandalawala. What the first image that comes to the mind is miniature paintings. And therefore, I thought it would be particularly apt to put my views uh, in particular context on flags with the help of miniature paintings and how the miniature paintings of Mughal period sort of associate with, uh, in these depictions, with the numismatic evidence. Um, so when we come to the Mughal period, we have the Mughal standard is historicized. Now we, we are in a different period where we have lots and lots and lots of textual evidence. We have accounts, we have travelogues, we have lots and lots of uh, uh, visual material to compare. So we have actually straddled a, 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 a completely different uh, area. Um, the alam, or a group of standards that was part of the Mughal courtly function, was a symbol of their kingship. And there are umpteen numbers of references which show that, I tell that the, the, the kind of four or five standards, poles upon which emblems of royalty were placed, were carried in procession, were present in, this, in, 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 the, in the court, and many times uh, marked important events such as conquest. So we know that when the Mughals occupied bulk, way up in Central Asia in 1645, the first thing that was happening to mark the conquest that was the standards walked, marched in. Then the governor walked in. So the, the entry of these standards was kind of marking the presence of Mughal sovereignty in these particular uh, um, uh, places. So they have particular concepts and particular roles. They have particular designs and particular shapes. They are made with material that one can study, fabric which is brocaded or embroidered, painted, is woven or uh, treated otherwise. What is shown and how and where are the inspirations of this coming from are interesting aspects to study these things. Um, contexts are very important. As we say, as I said, they are important in court culture and rituals. They are important in ornamentation. They display a certain penchant for luxury and lavishness. They, they also reflect identity and sovereignty. So uh, we see that much like the ancient symbols of standards, these also have varied levels of indexicality uh, that one can uh, see. And uh, as I said at the beginning, I am only going to concentrate on the Pachanama, primarily because it's so beautiful to look at, primarily because, also because it's so detailed that one can glo gloat over these paintings for a long time and take a lot back from a very closed, uh, close and closed reading of uh, the, this, this, this evidence. So uh, I open uh, the paintings with this wonderful uh, uh, picture of Jahangir receiving Khurram, uh, returning from the Mewar campaign, painted by Bal Chand uh, from the Pacha Nama. And everybody, the focus of the attention is here. You know, that's where everybody's going to look. But down here, there are lots of other things happening. And just right there, you find there is a man carrying a flag. And what do you see on the flag? It's a flag has three pennants, or sort of what you call in vexillological terms, uh, a gone fallow, uh, with three pennants coming out of it. And uh, there is a symbol here, which is the symbol of the lion and the sun rising. Um, numismatist uh, coin collectors would immediately recognize that symbol by these really magnificent coins of Jahangir. And we know uh, from Jahangir's own memoirs 
that these coins were struck for a very specific use. They were not, uh, they were not circulatory coins. Although they were struck to monetary standards, they were one tola in weight. Uh, they were not intended for everyday circulation. Jahangir was known to have given these pieces to his favorites and acolytes as a gesture of um, a special favor. And why, why was this a, such a special favor? Because uh, to cite the king was a privilege. The king would not show you himself. You, know, you can't just go and walk in, into his palace and see him. You have to have an appointment. You have to have a particular decorum. You also have to pay. Uh, the Mughal kings, when they gave audiences to people, they actually asked for nazars. So, you know, they were particularly aware of their own worth. And uh, these objects actually facilitated the recipients to see the king whenever they want. So this was a kind of favor that the king bestowed on his favorite acolytes so that they could actually have the pleasure of seeing him whenever they wished to. So they did not have to perf you know, sort of fit into this decorum. So these were very, very important objects. And one of the persons that was given this particular objects, um, these do not have any mint name on them. We know that they were struck in the sixth regnal year of Jahangir. Soon after sixth regnal year, in regnal year eight and nine, Jahangir had moved his court to Ajmer to conduct the campaign against Mewar of which we saw the painting. Um, and while he was in Mewar, uh, while, he was, while the court was stationed in Ajmer, similar coins with his portrait and uh, the lion and the sun emblem were also struck. And in Ajmer, one of the favorite recipients or, of these things uh, was Sir Thomas Rowe, the first ambassador, uh, the first British ambassador, English ambassador to the court. And he had maintained a very good uh, record uh, of his diaries, and in, in the embassy of Thomas Rowe, we find this mention that you know, he, he very vividly describes what happened when he went to see the king. The king reached out and gave him a coin, which was as big as sixpence. And he's very, very clear about the importance of the object. He says, this is not worth in all, is the, the value of it is only 30 pounds, 30 livres, he says, 30 li. Um, but for, um, yet it was, five times as good as any he gives in that kind. So it is basically it's a great pleasure. The, the, the value of the, the favor that he received through this token gesture was not the value of the object itself. It was something much, much more. And he says, for, it's an especial favor for all, for that all the great men that wear the king's image receive no other than a medal of gold as big as sixpence with the little chain of four inches to fasten it on their heads. And this was actually used to either put them on the turbans or in, on the shash and as a life-preserving amulet that is very, very clearly mentioned in Mughal texts. And you can see that this particular coin has the picture of Jahangir on one side. Inscriptions run on both sides. These are poetic inscriptions in, uh, in Persian. Unlike the previous objects, these, this particular coin does mention that it, it was struck in Ajmer and also gives the eighth year of his reign. Um, Thomas Rowe was actually slightly later. And, but I have a hunch that this must be the coin that must have been given to him. Why? Because there are some very interesting evidences to that. Soon after Thomas Rowe's uh, event, uh, embassy uh, visit to Ajmer, the first ever map of Mughal India was created by the famous cartographer William Baffin, who then subsequently ended up in Canada and ended up giving the name to Baffin's Bay, which is in northern Canada. And this is the map. And uh, much of the topographical information in this map is based on the evidence provided by Thomas Rowe. And how did that happen? Because William Baffin was the master's mate the captain's mate on the ship on which Thomas Rowe traveled back to England. And I'm pretty sure that Thomas Rowe must have preserved this great coin that he got as a gift from the emperor, and he must have shown it to William Baffin at some point, because uh, up there in the corner is this detail. 
and you see that it shows the Mughal emblem and calls it Insignia Pontetissimi, uh, this most potent emblem of, uh, of the Mughal kings. And it is exactly the same way in which the, uh, the lion and the sun is, is engraved on the Ajmer coin. Um, I'll show you uh, once again later on. But once this particular emblem starts circulating in print media in Europe, it becomes almost emblematic of the Mughal Empire. And this is, again, a little bit later, 1655, Edward Terry's A Voyage to East Indies, East India, shows exactly the same thing, and it's an imperial standard of the great Mughal, and it's exactly the same emblem with the lion seated in a particular way with his paws crossed over uh, with, against each other. The origins of this emblem are Central Asian, and we find this much, much earlier, about 200 years before the time of Jahangir. We have this account of uh, embassy of Ro, uh, Roy Gonzalez de Clavijo uh, from the court, at the court of Ta uh, Timur the Great in, in Samarkand. And when he was there, he finds that the court, he describes the way he met uh, the great uh, Timur uh, Tamerlane. And he says, on the top of the doorway, which was leading to the court, there was the figure of the lion and the sun, which are the arms of the Lord of Samarkand. Now, this Lord, Lord of Samarkand is a very interesting uh, uh, mention. Because the connection here is through the Lord of Samarkand. And we know that the Mughals considered themselves as the descendants of Timur. They showed their genealogy in all their genealogical seals all the way up to Timur. And Timur himself had inherited the Central Asian Empire from the Chagatais. And the Mughals therefore called themselves as Chagatais. Now they were not genetically Chagatais. Chagatai was the son of Changiz Khan. Mughals had no connection from their father's side to the to Changiz Khan. Um, but they were politically Chagatais. And they constantly mentioned themselves as Chagatais. So the, the, the connection of Lords of Samarkand is the Chagatayid connection. The, the, the emblem was Chagatayid emblem, and that was, in, uh, was uh, adopted first by Timur, and then from Timur it was adopted by, uh, by uh, the Mughals. Um, we have more references, such as Peter Mundi's travels. Uh, in 1632, he witnessed the cavalcade, and he says, you know, Thousands of horsemen going breathwise, uh, elephants of state uh, w walking around in the cavalcade, some of them carrying a flag with the king's arms, which is a tiger couching with the sun rising over his back. Now, there is a particular ambiguity here between tiger and lion. Uh, sometimes in some emblems, it's very clearly a lion, on sometimes it's clearly a tiger. And that is particularly that kind of ambiguity realize, it sort of arises because in Persian, in Farsi, the same word is used for both animals, it's sher. So sher is also a tiger, sher is also a lion. So it kind of conflates the two images. So sometimes people see it as tiger, sometimes they see it as lion. And very interestingly, a, a direct uh, um, uh, concordance to what Peter Mundy describes is seen in this fantastic painting from the Pacha Nama, uh, a royal procession uh, uh, shown uh, walking around, and here you can in the see in the in the center there are these flag bearers, and the flags have exactly the the the, the lion, a crouching lion, and the sun coming behind his back. Processions seem to be the main focus where these flags are being shown. So we have more processions, such as this one, painted by Ram Das. Um, and it is um, uh, the receiving of Prince Khurram uh, from the return of, or from Deccan kind of procession. He's, he's, the, the prince is marching to the royal capital in procession. And right in the front, there are these uh, uh, the flag bearer with the lion and the sun flag. What is very interesting here, as you can see, is that all the decorations on this flag appear to be kind of Chinese in a way. The, the depiction of the clouds is very chinoise in, in its execution. And it's probably, this is my guess, this is probably because the cloth, the textile, must be Chinese silk. 
and it is coming directly uh, from the Chinese uh, kind of influence. But also the fact that the Chinese influence also extended all the way to Central Asia. So whether it is coming in India through China, through the textile trade, or whether it is coming in India through the Central Asian connection, that we are not very clear about. But there is certainly a, a very distinct Chinese element in, in these uh, pictures. Um, much like uh, modern times, the flags were also shown as part of military expeditions. So we saw in Sanchi, uh, the flags were shown as part of the Buddhist uh, kind of war scene. Here also, you have uh, the capture of Port Hooghly. Uh, the, 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 the Mughals had a naval battle with the Portuguese. And on this side, there's a Portuguese Navy. On this side, the Mughal Navy. And the Mughal Navy all carry the flags with the lion and the sun emblems, uh, which is just, just about there. Um, very, very clearly shown uh, with this. Uh, similarly, uh, the scene from the capture of uh, Kandahar. This is not Kandahar in Afghanistan. This is Kandahar in Maharashtra. Believe me, there's a Kandahar in Maharashtra near Nanded in, in Marathwada. And this was uh, a capture scene, uh, uh, Mughal, Mughals attacking the fort of Kandahar. And here you see uh, these two sort of pennants um, uh, with, with, uh, with the soldiers, and again, very clearly, uh, the same emblem. Um, here, there is no Chinese embroidery around. This is more the sort of typical Mughal kind of decorations with flowers and lily flowers and that sort of uh, motifs. Um, we can see that there are direct numismatic correspondences. Uh, the coin that was stuck in Ajmer has the seated lion with the, the sun behind it. Exactly the similar form, seated lion with paws sort of crossed over and the sun behind it. And um, the other depictions were not from this repertoire of coinage, but from the repertoire of the famous zodiacal coins that were struck by Jahangir. Everybody knows about the zodiacal coins. I did not wax lyrical about them. But you can see that the kind of depiction that you see on zodiacal rupees of the sun, the, the sign of Leo here, is very similar. The kind of, you know, the, the leg, the front paw that the lion ra raises here is pretty similar to what is shown on this flag. Very similar here as well, this kind of, you know, this particular sort of extension of one, one paw, um, very clearly shown. So these emblems were circulating in the wider visual repertoire of the Mughal world, the Mughal artistic world, and they have been sort of, you know, uh, moving, cross-pollinating from dye engravers, from jewelry makers, for, to painters, everybody sharing and taking part, taking the kind of same thing. Um, what is very interesting is this is not all about uh, coins, uh, or not, indeed, not all about just the lion and the sun emblem. There are other examples. So, Another example of the painting shows the lion and the sun on one of the flags here. But on the other flag, there is the sea morgue, the mythical bird uh, from Central Asia. So very clearly, another Central Asian uh, connection. And of course, these two uh, emblems are very famously seen in architecture in Bukhara and Samarkand. So again, this whole Chagatayid link of the Mughals with the Central Asian domains is very clearly seen in, in these objects. The last and not quite interesting bit on the Mughal flags was also the dragon, which in Farsi was known as Azdaha. And uh, we can see that this is depicted on these flags. Again, one of the paintings of the Prince Darashiko's wedding scene. Uh, the presents are being carried, quite lavish presents uh, being carried. Um, um, and the flags that are being carried behind have the dragon emblems on that. So you can see that not all of this flag imagery is reciprocated by coins. Coins are picking up only certain imageries, not all. The Simurg bird or the dragon never appear on coins. The, only the sun, land and the sun appears. And you can see that the, the dragon was very much part of the Mughal alams. This is a court scene. These guys at the back are holding up these standards of sovereignty. And one of the standards of sovereignty has a, a small tiny little dragon up here. So the dragon was very much part of uh, the symbol of sovereignty for the Mughals. Not all flags had depictions on them. 
There were some flags which were purely ceremonial, purely to show that we are rich enough to get this kind of great cloth and flutter it in our, in our, uh, uh, in our processions. So that is this example where the flag is uh, very clearly just embroidered pieces with, with uh, three pennants. And this is where the origins of the later flags, the Maratha Zaripatka, uh, come from. This is where, this is the first ever, according to me, this is the earliest representation of what Zaripatka literally means. It's embroidered flag, and this is what it is. And it is also the same Maratha color as well. So it's quite an interesting, what is the ancestry, what is the genealogy of further flags that people were appropriating from Mughals? So to just to quickly encapsulate, uh, uh, Mughal flags, the lion and sun have Chagatai origins. There is no fixed imagery. That is also very interesting. There is the lion and the sun. The lion is shown as passant, couchant, courant, assiant, all sorts of different fashions. Uh, there are other Central Asian motifs. Simur bird is there, and the dragon is there. And there is a distinct Chinese cloud backdrop uh, connection. It is also important to remember that in the alums that they're carrying in the court, there are Chinese bundles of Chinese silk on them as well. So it was obviously a, a luxury item worth parading in terms of indicating wealth. There are many shapes. There are rectangular, triangular, pendant-like with triangular tips, you name it. Some of them are purely ornamental, as I showed, brocaded. The colors are usually bright shades of red, saffron, purple, and green. There are not many other shades that we see. There are different contexts in which Mughal flags are shown, military, processional, courtly functions and rituals, the, the courtly rituals, I mean. And there are direct similarities with coin designs, but not all flag motifs are found on coins. So here as well, there are different levels of indexicality. The, I thought it is better to end the discussion slightly further up from the Mughal period, in the late Mughal period, and how sort of denote how the flags then become indexical symbols on coins. And the best example that I can find for indexical symbols on, of a flag on coins are Maratha issues. So these are Maratha coins um, where the, the, the flag was sort of shown as a symbol of distinct Maratha affinity. And what is fascinating is that Wherever the Maratha Empire went, this was uh, Nasik in Maharashtra, Sagar in Madhya Pradesh, Nagpur uh, in eastern Maharashtra, but also very interestingly in Lahore. Now Lahore was occupied by Marathas for only about four or five months. But in that particular small period of four or five months, they issued coins by deliberate inclusion of this little flag in the design. So this tells us that there is a particular indexical value to the inclusion of that symbol. That was indicating Maratha presence. It was, it was, and then of course, when the Marathas are chucked out of Lahore, it disappears. It doesn't, it doesn't stay there. So it's an interesting thing that how these particular emblems, then we are coming closer and closer to our current conception of flags. You know, in Mughal times, the flags were varied. You know, there were, there were lots of different variations in the theme. Here, all of them, you can see that they're either sort of triangular or with two pennants. So, you know, we are, we are getting a kind of um, functional performatic, sort of performatic use uh, uh, with, with this. And the best examples of these kind of flags of me own, like, you know, my flag or my king's flag is seen on the coins of Tipu Sultan. And you can see that there's an elephant, and here there's a sun, and the decorations around the flag are these kind of particular motifs of tiger stripes. And they were, you know, they were part of Tipu's decorations, everything. Everything that was, that was owned by Tipu had uh, something to do with the tiger stripe on it. And this particular um, Single tiger stripe motif is also seen on guns, is seen on jewelry, is seen on objects in his personal possessions, and also very much on, on, on the coins. Lastly, I would say uh, we have to come to some British uh, uptake of this kind of imagery. And the best example, the most astonishing example that I can think of is the medal that was struck uh, for the, the capture of Sirangapatanam 
the, the ultimate, the last victory of Tipu Sultan over Tipu Sultan. And uh, it's a very intriguing design from a design history point of view. First of all, it is so loaded with stereotypes. The British lion is killing uh, the Indian or the Tipu's tiger. Now, Tipu, you know, they sort of acknowledge that Tipu was associated with a tiger here. And uh, this kind of very strange feline battle that is going on here. And the British lion is identified by this flag which is flying, flying behind it. And the in inscription on that flag says, Asadallah al Ghalib. And that is, interestingly, the appellation of Imam Ali. It has got nothing to do with Britain. But they have appropriated this, uh, and the Lion of God, which is Lion of Allah, really, is now, has become now the British Lion. So in a very strange kind of cross-cultural appropriation, the Britons uh, consider themselves as uh, the Lion of Allah in, in a funny way. Um, well, I could go on and on and on and on forever because uh, I have noticed, you know, one, one learns constantly. I'm very grateful for uh, having this opportunity because this has made me aware how much more work there is to be done. And uh, I'm sorry I did not come to the questions that were raised by Ranjit to start with about Indian heraldry, but there is definitely that, that element in it. Uh, maybe. At, at a future uh, occasion, I would take this story further from here, from Tipu Sultan, from 19th and 20th century, where that interesting aspect comes in between. And there also coins play a very important role because some of the symbols that appear on coins are then taken up in the question of, uh, the, in formulation of Indian heraldry. Uh, Ranjit surely knows that there was a college of arms established in Calcutta where coat of arms were designed, made to, uh, you know, and given, presented to all Indian Maharajas and princely states. What actually constituted in those coat of arms had very strong numismatic links, very much so. So that is uh, for another day, I would say. So uh, thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, uh, Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj, Vastu Sangralaya, and the Museum Society of Mumbai for giving me this opportunity. And I have outlined all my numismatic resources, and I did not, I need not name them individually, but thanks are due to all of them. And thank you very much for, very much for every one of you to, for bearing with me for nearly an hour or so. Thank you. Remarkable journey through several periods. And uh, for drawing these, these comparative links and embedding notions of symbolism in, in context, I was just gonna say that if it's any help, Idris Shah, propounds what I think might be a crank theory, but somewhere in, in his study of Sufism, he points out that, you know, Richard the Lionheart, there were lions were not, lions are native to the UK, points out that it could be the mark of a Sufi initiation, the Kalb, Kalb al Namr, the heart of the lion. So this might, this sheification of the British Empire might not be as outrageous as it seems, but that was a remarkable, uh, another one of the many cross-cultural uh, transitions that you pointed out. I just want to draw you out on, on one or two questions before opening it up to, I know there will be many questions. It just struck me as you were talking about uh, the Mughal period that uh, sumptuary rules in the Mughal Empire grew stronger and stronger, significations of who you were, what your entitlements were, where your place in society was. Uh, or at court specifically, and what kind of distance or proximity you had from the emperor. So in that, in that context, I was just thinking that it's strange that something so visibly symbolic as a flag or a pennant, uh, there were no stringent rules for that. In, uh, are there textual sources in the Mughal period that dwell on, on this? On this? Um, thank you. Uh, um, I don't think, I have not come across any textual sources that come sort of describe flags in, you know, black and white as it were. <laughs> uh, not, not, very, not in very distinct, clear forms, uh, surely not. Um, I'm, of course, when you say Mughal sources, there are so many that one needs to sort of, you know, I haven't been able to trawl through all the finer details of all the texts that one can look into. Um, what is interesting is uh, I've just focused on one particular kind of flag. But there are paintings in which there are other kinds of flags also visible. 
So there must, there definitely was a code. There must, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there must have been personal flags of Sardars or whoever they were. And you can see them, you can see them uh, uh, in, uh, in these paintings. So for example, when, uh, you know, the, in, in the Pachanama itself, there are paintings uh, which show uh, conquests. So there is a conquest of Daulatabad, Kandar I sh I've shown, there is Ausa, all this kind of Deccan campaign that was going on. And there are pictures in which uh, some of these Sardars have particular flags. So there is a flag which has white backdrop with purple horizontal stripe, almost like star and stripes, <laughs> so to say. But, um, and uh, I, I don't know anyone, in, in, I, don't, I, I, don't, I have not come across any particular, I mean, one, as I said at the beginning, one of the things that I have s spotted, that there is a, this is a huge lacuna. Um, I haven't come across any study of Indian flags. Uh, everybody talks about flags from a sort of early modern context. I mean, there was a, a flag conference in Oslo, so it seems. I found a book. And uh, everybody's talking about anthropology of flags, but from a very post-national kind of you know, emergence of nation state kind of uh, way. Um, similarly, nobody has talked about uh, flags in ancient India. I mean, we, they are there, they, they're, they're very much there. Were, they, were those cloth, clo, cloths plain? What, what were they made of? You can see them in Ajanta. I mean, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't drawn at all from Ajanta, but you can see that they're everywhere. But, um, and that's the reason why I said that uh, somebody should take it up as a PhD project. Uh, and it would be a, a very worthwhile uh, to come into. And uh, it seems like, uh, you know, that uh, flippant Wikipedia entry saying that flags were first invented in India might even be true because um, we have very clear visual metaphoric references in Rig Rigveda. I mean, that's, that's going to several, the you know, first millennium BC behind sort of thing. And um, yeah, so there, there is a lot of uh, uh, room to populate this story much beyond what, what I've sort of, you know, I, 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 I must say that I've just scra scratched the surface of it all, so. I'm actually just going to open this up for, uh, for questions and maybe come back with a final question. Something. Is there a mic that can travel? Yeah. Uh, do we have questions? The standards on the stupa in Sanchi that you showed reminded me immediately of the Roman Republic standard, SPQR, and there are, uh, there are linkages of trade between the Roman Empire and India at this time. Is there some kind of exchange happening from where that may have come to South Asia or, or travel the other way? Uh, do you have thoughts about that? Um, uh, thanks, thanks for the question. Uh, just to populate uh, more details into the story. It's surely, uh, uh, they are very, very similar to the Romans, but uh, they're also very similar to Parthians. And, uh, if you read in general about history of standards and flags, you will find that the generic Eurocentric narrative begins by Egypt, from Egypt. So there, is, there are Egyptian standards, and there is uh, you know, boars, and, and all sorts of uh, animals, uh, uh, um, what's it, uh, hawks, you know, all the Egyptian gods and goddesses, uh, 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 ram, all those, all those kind of things. And, uh, what is interesting uh, is that uh, a, a book that was written in late 19th century about the history of flags makes a very interesting point that flags of the kind that we know, fabric flags, were um, very difficult to create because the textile that was actually used was quite heavy. So it would not flutter. It, was, it would never sort of have, it would not go perpendicular to the staff and flutter. Yeah? The kind of flags that go, could flutter were a possibility only after the Western world became aware of silk. And there is that particular connection between India and China with silk, the usage of silk, uh, that you find. And of course there are, you are very much correct in identifying there is a kind of Roman style in it. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit cynic about that and uh, I think that there are objects which, uh, I mean, so, sorry to uh, <laughs> whinge against the art historians in the audience, but, <laughs> but there are uh, objects which, whose nature or construction is decided by their function. 
you know. And a lot of times, art historians do not take that on board. You know, they like to make interesting comparisons between Roman flags and Indian flags. The fact remains that both are flags, both have a particular function. So the functionality of the object decides how they are constructed, you know. And that is a very important aspect. So I would not immediately jump to the conclusion that there was something Roman about them. Um, of course, Romans had flags, Indians had flags. Both had the same function. So they would be very similar in their uh, construction, as it were. The Parthians, uh, they said that uh, the way uh, uh, the Parthian flag was uh, a staff and a horizontal shaft on which the apron of a blacksmith was hung. I mean, why particularly apron of a blacksmith, that's a, there's a different story behind it. But the kind of construction where a shaft, a horizontal stick, and something hanging off it is not just Roman, but it's also Parthian, it's also Indian. Um, I haven't even looked into China, so but I'm sure there must be something very similar in China. But uh, part of the matter, part of that construction arises from the fact that the cloth that actually hangs has to be light. So, you know, otherwise the whole thing might just collapse. So. Sir, Sir my um, observation is uh, regarding uh, Satvahana coins. This is from Shobhana Gokhale's book I have observed. See, a lion symbol, Simha Mudra, as it has been used by, um, you know, Gautami Putra Shatakarni during his campaigns and all. Simha Mudra has been used like uh, a statement of the campaigns of the rulers. And it has been richly adopted by most of the South Indian dynasties. And it continued. And regarding the mood of the Simham, sometimes it's represented as you know, pouncing simham. Okay. And sometimes it is observant simham. And another one uh, I would like to share with you is, uh, uh, you have mentioned about trident, Shiva, Rudra. The same anthropomorphic representation you will find in Gudimallam. Yes. On the sculpture. So I think that pan-Indian, I won't use because it has so many connotations, <laughs> but in a true sense, the literal sense of the word, I think the influence is very big. As you have rightly pointed out, because you have taken us beyond the boundaries on the north side. Sure. So, and I wanted to know whether the Simha Mudra had continued further, because I, I'm not very much aware of the numismatic. Right. Uh, this. Thank you, sir. I mean, the, the Simha, the lion symbolism has, as I said, has... Um, many vocabularies. One is, in the Buddhist context, is definitely a symbol of the Buddha, because the Buddha regard, was regarded as the Shakya Simha. And uh, in fact, uh, one of the very enigmatic and important coins that was, well, coin-like coins, objects, or whatever that was, because it's unique. It's a gold coin discovered in Tilia Tepe in Afghanistan, where there is a lion on one side, and uh, a Vajrapani turning the wheel on the other side. But the lion is identified with an inscription as the lion whose fear has been dispelled. So he says, Sinha Vigato Bhaya. And uh, that is a particular appellation for the Buddhist lion because he's enlightened, so all his fears have been, has, have been dispelled. Um, whether the same kind of uh, you know, lion symbolism carries on is difficult to say because, as I said, they have multiple vocabularies. So on coins, lion might uh, symbolize not just Buddhist, but also the royalty kind of appellation. As you say, it's pouncing, so it's prowess, it's virility, you know, it's the association of masculinity with uh, the lion symbol as well. So it has lots and lots of um, coded messages in it. Uh, what precisely what the, the king who issued the coins wanted, we don't know. So, yeah. <laughs> if there are no more questions, I think maybe this is the moment to thank you, uh, for. But there are many. Uh, did you have a question, for, was it? Okay. What's that? Yes, of course. Yeah. No, 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 no. no. What else? 
that's right. These are those Brechtian moments when the backstage <laughs> mechanisms become very clear. But um, no, I just want to thank you then, since Feroza has now delegated this task to me, uh, to thank you for opening up so many questions and to, for also, also for reminding us that these repertoires of vocabularies of symbolism remain open to reading and rereading and that that is one of our functions as people preoccupied with cultural history. What is it that these symbols meant in their own time? What do they mean now? And how best can we involve ourselves in a larger sense of the multiple pasts that we inherit? So on that note, I'm going to thank you and thank all of you for having been here this evening.